I think we'll get started. Um, people can just uh, join us as they come in. It is lunch hour, so uh, people are sometimes getting food and that sort of uh, thing, of course. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is one of our first uh, TIFA Talks uh, sessions. Uh, I saw some of you last week at our, uh, our discussion around uh, supporting gender identity students uh, who are transitioning or having gender identity issues or concerns in their school. So thank you for coming out again. Uh, pardon the pun, coming uh, out uh, again. <laughs> but I'm <bummed>. <laughs> <laughs> um, The way we're going to structure this, uh, I'm just going to get each of the panelists to um, just basically introduce themselves, do a very short, maybe five minutes uh, introduction of uh, who they are and uh, a little bit of their career as an educator. Uh, and then we're going to ask some questions and have an opportunity for, for you to ask them some questions as well. Uh, so you may recognize Glenn Hansman. Uh, he is our guest from the BCTF president, a very busy man. And so we're really thankful that he's able to take uh, time out of his day to uh, be here with us today. Uh, and uh, to the lens or left here, we have Miriam Dumont, who uh, has also been an educator. Uh, you know what, I'm going to let Miriam introduce herself. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves. Uh, Glenn, Miriam, John, and Megan, and I'm going to let them say a few words about themselves. So, Megan, why don't we start with you? Megan uh, is a teacher at U Hill, so she may have to dash out uh, to go back to actually teach. <laughs> so I might just cram it all in right now? Sure. Sure? Sure? Yeah. Okay. I've, I've given them some questions and uh, any kind of inspiring story they may have, so Megan doesn't miss out on that. She's going to cram it all in. <laughs> okay. So as you mentioned, I'm at the high school, University Hill. Um, and I'm now the art teacher there, and I think I've been teaching overall for about 17, 18 years. Um, I decided to come out after I taught it. Uh, I had short contracts in many different schools, and hopefully, you know, you'll see what that's like. So six months here, a year there, and all this. I was always out to my staff, um, and I never sort of. Uh, I, I just never identified myself. I spoke with great authority on uh, LGBTQ issues. So I think the kids, some, some of the kids picked up on it. Um, but it wasn't until at U Hill I was there for two or three years and I had taught uh, every single grade eight, social studies eight, uh, for two or three years in a row. I sort of felt almost like their unofficial mascot. I knew every single one of them and so by grade by the time those kids were in grade maybe 10 or 11, uh, an opportunity came up to, for me to, uh, with another colleague, to go to Japan with, uh, I think, 16 of these kids, um, most of whom I knew really, really well. And uh, one of the, the mothers of uh, one of the students uh, was staying with me, so there was a, a mother and a father uh, staying with us. And um, she said something uh, funny to me one night. She said, oh, uh, so I hear your husband is Japanese. Yeah. So uh, you, you must. Uh, that's why you, you know, loaded them with all this etiquette and everything about Japan. And I said, oh, I'm more like a wife. And uh, <laughs> and she said, oh, really? Well, that makes a lot of sense because when I said the word husband to my daughter, she she had a funny look on her face and said, I don't know about that, mom. <laughs> and and so so I said, well, and I had already, this is sort of premeditated, I had already decided, I think we were the last school to not have a gay straight alliance club in the entire district. It felt like we were the last school. And so I had already sort of planned to start that after the Japan trip because it, you know, was quite demanding organizing it. So so I thought, and, and I'd always promised myself, you know, you, I feel personally that you can't sponsor a GSA unless you're completely out. So, um, so I said, why don't you tell your daughter? She's right on the money there, you know? Um, she was right. So, so by the next morning, I, I, they were all smiling at me. These 16 children were all just beaming these little smiles at me. And, uh, and then, uh, Later on that afternoon, I think I got us temporarily lost. I'm really bad with directions. So I had the map out, and um, 
and, and I, was, I was kind of frustrated, and I heard them whispering, and then all of a sudden I heard, get her, and then they just kind of dogpiled me in this big, giant, it was, not dogpiled, I wasn't injured, uh, but, but, but yeah, it was just a giant group hug, and I think, I think that was pretty clear. Uh, what they were trying to tell me so I felt I felt really safe so just in the same way that you know we expect our our kids to feel safe um, before they come out to themselves first of all and then and then um, their peers and or maybe an adult um, I think you deserve that too I think um, you you shouldn't feel guilty that you're not out um, I felt I felt safe. I felt like that was really my school at that point. I, I belonged there. So, um, anyways, so uh, obviously the advantages to coming out are I had a lot of kids come out to me after that, uh, even before that, because they could see that I had a lot of knowledge in that area, um, and that I created a really safe, open place to talk about those issues. Um, but um, one, uh, so I always was worried that it would affect my relationship with the students. So far, I've only really had one negative experience. One student wouldn't uh, attend my class uh, uh, as soon as he realized my orientation. He stopped attending, and then his mother was his greatest advocate, actually. Um, she was quite a, a bigot, and she, uh, <laughs> she, she said, uh, you know they were new to Can or she was new to Canada, and she she said, well, there's there's no way he should have to attend that that uh, I don't know what word she used in that meeting. I wasn't in there, um, but uh, that teacher's class. Um, and luckily, I had an administrator who said, well, welcome to Canada. You you really can't discriminate against a teacher uh, based on their orientation. Um, so, anyways, I think we marked him absent for several months until I think they finally just let him go. Um, and then, uh, the, so I thought it would, again, I thought it would affect my relationship with the students, but actually um, the only uh, really heavy duty negative uh, experience I had was with a colleague. And that really surprised me. Because um, you, you think you're educators, you think, where we're really at, you know, when I was growing up, it was barely at the level of tolerance in the 1980s. Now we're at full acceptance. So you think you're, you're all on the same team. Well, not all on that, that team, but, you know, so, <laughs> but, but, you know, um, so anyways, uh, basically, um, my greatest advice to you is if you have a colleague who has singled you out, and uh, this, this colleague basically uh, said, by me starting the GSA, so it started as soon as the GSA started. Um, by me starting a GSA in our school, which is the mandate of the school board to have one in every school, um, basically uh, the, me by doing that was harassing her. And she uh, used uh, what's the most offensive part of this is this uh, colleague used uh, a process which is supposed to protect people like me from bigotry, from discrimination. And she subverted the whole process to actually harass me based on my orientation. So, um, so my advice to you is if somebody barks at you, don't be diplomatic. I was diplomatic, biggest mistake three and a half year mistake. So um, it, it, it will cause you great stress. Um, it, it can affect your relationships, it can affect the way you teach, and it really messes with your worldview when something like that happens. So my, I, bark back, go straight to your union. As soon as you think somebody's treating you unfairly, um, I just wasn't that kind of person, you know, oh, well, that's an ignorant person. I'm just going to stay away from them. No, they, uh, you know, if you whimper away from a dog, you know what happens. So, so anyways, go straight to your union. Um, and then uh, I think 
I think that's about, sorry, that wasn't a nice note to end on. <laughs> but, 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 yeah. But and, that situation and, was resolved, uh, I, uh, As it deals with me, right. it was resolved, but it continued on for several years with every administrator after me. So, right. yeah. Um, and you can, um, you can read the 39-page dismissal of that case, the BC Human Rights Tribunal. So it started at the union level, and then when this person lost at the union level, um, they took it to the BC Human Rights Tribunal. So that's why it was three and a half years. Um, so you can, you can just Google it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Read the th Usually a dismissal is three pages long. This was 39 pages. I think they were trying to make a make it obvious why it had been dismissed. So, right. yeah. Well, we're glad that you're in a better space today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And that things are going well. And the GSA is still going well at you, though? Not so much. I, I, oh, that's the, that's the thing I wanted to talk about. So GSAs are a funny thing. They are like a, a living creature. They, they, like a lot of clubs, they kind of phase in and phase out. I um, always introduce myself on the, the first day of classes as the, one of the safe contacts at the school. Um, I also, um, I know it's, uh, I, sometimes I feel like I have a, a bit of a cover, not a cover, but a, a safety net uh, because I have now two kids, two five-year-olds. Um, I also, I, so I mentioned them. So I'm, what, what am, you can see what I'm really doing there. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of saying, hey, I'm happy. I have a partner. I have two kids. And uh, most of my students at U Hill are Asian um, uh, from many different backgrounds, um, but uh, new and uh, um, new to Canada and, and uh, a lot of kids who've been here for generations. And I, I make it really obvious that my partner is Asian Canadian and, uh, and I was trying to get that in there too um, because, you know, a lot of the kids think, well, oh yeah, it's easy for you. But, uh, and I, you know, that we're happy and we're out and, yeah. Thank you. And, and I did try to, uh, it, it was very challenging to get panelists who were actually able to come up to UBC from 12 to 1 because as you can imagine, most teachers are working. Um, and so I did try to uh, actually uh, have a bit more diversity on the panel. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way, but we've got fabulous panelists anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for you coming. Guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. One quick question before sure. you go. Did you have support of your other colleagues when you were going through all of this? Oh, uh, okay. I only had, literally, I only had the support of maybe three colleagues, and the reason, it wasn't because they wouldn't have been supportive. It was because uh, the worst part of that three and a half years was, I could not talk about this to anyone um, and it felt like going right back into the closet so I think that made it um, doubly painful um, that I couldn't talk to anybody I just shared it with my family and my union reps um, so that made it quite horrible that no one knew this was happening um, right under their noses yeah Okay, but if it wasn't a legal, <laughs> if it wasn't a legal case, I'm assuming that uh, if it was just sort of tension between colleagues, uh, many of the students in, in the room are, are likely allies, and so mm -hmm. your advice to them as colleagues. Tell your colleague to go to the union, because I, I, I didn't. I right. tried to be diplomatic. I tried to reason with an unreasonable person. It's not a it's not a teachable moment. This is an adult. You're not gonna you're not gonna change their mind. They're not gonna start to like you. Just let it go and protect yourself so that you stop it before it begins. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. <laughs> oh, before you go ahead, I have a gift for you. I wasn't uh Ready for this so soon, but <laughs> you're oh, no, dashing no, off so preview. I better do this now. Oh, thank you okay, so much you. for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Oh, 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 that's probably important. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um,
so we're going to go kind of back to our original plan, which was <laughs> uh, just to have uh, short introductions, and then we're going to do a little bit of a uh, question and answer and get some questions from you. So uh, let's start with uh, Miriam, because she's right beside me. <laughs> I'm Miriam. Um, I identify as queer, and um, my partner's trans, and we have two kids together, a three-and-a-half-year-old and a, a one-year-old. And I've been with the Vancouver School Board since 2008, um, and I'm currently, yeah, 2008, and I'm currently off right now. Um, I'm at home with my kids, and uh, I've always been out in my workplace. Mm -hmm. And when you say always been out to, uh, I've always been out to the faculty, fa to the students, colleagues, uh, and the students. parents, okay. everyone. Because that's one of the questions is, mm -hmm. is there's, there are sort of levels of coming out and many people are comfortable being out with colleagues but maybe not with students or with parents. So that's kind of an, in, an interesting distinction. And I should add that I, um, I'm an elementary school teacher so I uh, teach typically, I've taught grade one or grade five. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Miriam. Yeah, I'm Glenn Hansman. I'm currently the president of the BCTF but I'm on leave from my Grade three, four, five, six, seven special ed class in Vancouver, and uh, the anti-homophobia consultant or mentor role, the VSB. My name is still technically on that, um, and I was out in university during my practicum, and from day one as a teacher as well. Oh, I'm sorry. I was <laughs> I was out in the classroom as well with both students, staff, and the parent community, as well as uh, a student teacher as well when I did my practicum at McGill. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question for Miriam. Were you out on your practicum at all? Um, I wasn't identifying as queer at the time. At, okay. As queer at the time, so I wasn't out. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. And John? Hi, I'm John Harrison, and I'm a former teacher and um, vice principal. Uh, principal. I taught here at UBC for three years as a faculty associate, and also at SFE for two years. And um, when I was in the school system, I've been retired for six years from the Burnaby School Board. And when I um, started in the school system, which you would probably call the dark ages, um, <laughs> things were a lot different. And, and it, it was not a big topic of discussion. It was, you know, it was something you talked about behind closed door. And I was not out with staff. Um, until I was appointed a head teacher um, in my fifth year of teaching, and then I got really comfortable be because I was always r really um, close to, to my staff members, and I really believed that being in education, it was all about creating caring and inclusive communities. But it didn't come out then because there was a lot of issues. As a matter of fact, one of the major issues that I over was in um, a party to and just watching it evolve was um, just um, if some of you might recall Surrey School District yes. trying to ban um, any books that talked about same-sex families or anything so that was the, the big deal of my day um, when I after after I returned from UBC to my district I'd been out for five years uh, out of the district for five years and um, at that time, I don't know, some of you may recall, there was a, a, a very unfortunate incident years ago where a uh, Burnaby principal was um, fired for, um, for making pornography, and it was an enormous event at the time. And I was returning the following year, and I, uh, there was a principal in my district that wanted me to come back to, as his VP. And I remember thinking, there's no way I'll ever, mm -hmm. you know, be invited to be part of the administration team. And to my surprise, um, I got the position, and it was the first one in 25 years where they were appointed full-time vice principal. Um, and from there on in, it was all about um, again being an advocate for everybody. If you're trying, if your main goal is to create caring and inclusive communities, you've got to be. Um, standing up for everybody and looking out for everyone and uh, I was always out again with my staff but I was more careful at that time because of some of the rumblings that were still going around and if I could do it all again I would be out right away because I think um, kids really need the role model and they need to see you as somebody that, that validates them and can support them and I, I was always very active in supporting 
students in the school that, that, that a lot of teachers were bringing up before the team because they were having issues and sometimes they were sexual identity issues and we would look very you know very hard and very supportive of that so um, again I really encourage people to be out there and we also have SOGI policy sexual orientation and gender identity for the first time in the history of education and, and so everyone's protected so. so things have changed a lot uh, mm -hmm. over the years, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you could bring that perspective of, of the history of this, uh, of coming out as an educator in BC uh, to, the, to the table today, John. Um, I wanted to also just jump in, and um, I'm the moderator, but uh, can also give my perspective. Um, I did the teacher education program in uh, 2000 and uh, was, uh, was not out on my practicum. I didn't come out on my practicum uh, because I didn't at the time uh, feel completely comfortable with that. My, uh, my faculty, sorry, my, my faculty advisor was fabulous. My school advisor um, was uh, from Langley and was quite, uh, I would say, fundamentalist Christian. And um, I didn't get the sense that it would be, uh, she would look at it favorably. And so with that position that she had as my school advisor uh, and writing the reports on my practicum, I decided not to come out on my practicum. Um, I did not come out my first year of teaching, but my second year of teaching, um, I had a boy in the class, it was a grade four or five class, and I had a boy in grade four who was already starting to be teased a little bit mm. and was a little bit different and I kind of sensed his dad was very macho uh, and, uh, and I kind of sensed that this kid might be in for a bit of a rough ride around his sexual orientation or gender identity, I didn't know sort of what exactly at the time, but uh, I just decided right that year, this was my second year of teaching, that uh, I needed to be out uh, for that kid and for that uh, group of kids that he was going to go through school with. So I went to my administrator and uh, we came up with a plan and she said, great, I'll do this with you, we'll have a discussion about why it's important and so we did that and uh, from then on. Uh, in my um, in my teaching practice, that was something that I, I always did. I always talked to my students, not on the first day in September. Uh, it's not the most important part of who I am, but uh, certainly it was part of uh, part of what I shared with with kids and families and and everyone in my teaching practice. Uh, and then I actually through that and being out, got to know Glenn and Miriam and uh, joined the Pride Education Network, formerly Gay and Lesbian Educators of BC, and, uh, and ended up doing the uh, Anti-Homophobia and Diversity position at the BSB for, for four years. And, uh, and I continue to be employed <laughs> in uh, sexual orientation and gender identity education. Uh, so there are, uh, that's a, another little benefit of, of being out in, in education. Okay, uh, so my first question for people uh, are, what do you think are the advantages uh, of being out, and also, what are some of the disadvantages? Miriam? Um, well, I think some of the obvious advantages are that there's the role model piece, right? So you are going to have kids in your class uh, who either have queer families or will identify as LGBTQ at some, at some point, maybe when they're older or do right now, depending on their age. So I think, you know, kids often really connect with their teachers and there's a big attachment piece there. And so I think it's really incredible for them to have that person that they can see in front of them who they trust, who they can look up to, et cetera, et cetera, in their lives. So, um, and I think it's just as beneficial for the kids, again, who have queer families, maybe same-sex families or whatnot. Um, you know, in my experience, those families have been really, really grateful for the things that I have and haven't done in the classroom, like being really mindful of days like Mother's Days and Father's Days that maybe other teachers haven't been. Um, and those families just feel like their identities um, are really being respected. So there's that piece to it. And I think personally for myself, there's um, it's a big part of my identity, right? So for me, I actually, I do talk about it on the first day of school. <laughs> maybe not the first thing, but when I introduce myself, you know, like it's, it, it is a huge part of who I am. And so I talk about it right away. Um, 
just because for me, I it's it's really important to be out and I want them to know about who I am. And uh, I find that immediately there's connections there that are made. Like I can see some kids and the way they're kind of like nodding their head or their look changes. And it's for me personally, it's always been quite positive. Um, and it just feels really good to me f to, to have that out there, out in the open. Um, so there's that piece, I think, and maybe a negative. I mean, I haven't had really many negative things about being out in my workplace, but I'd say that sometimes you end up being kind of the go-to person around queer yeah. stuff, right? Um, which for me, it actually doesn't bother me because I feel really passionate about it and I like it and I like providing people with resources and I like being a safe person, but not everybody wants that, right? Like not everybody uh, who's a teacher in LGBTQ wants to be that go-to person. And I think sometimes that falls on you. Um, but also, you know, I know folks in the system who are able to kind of set that boundary. And in the past, I've made other people safe contacts in the school. Like I've stepped back, even though I'd like to be, because I think it's also important for allies to do the work. And then I've spent my energy um, being ally to other groups, right? Um, that, that again, for example, if it's the anti-racism committee or something, that work shouldn't just be done by racialized people. And so uh, I would be on that committee and let a straight person be on the safe committee or whatnot. So, yeah. Yeah, Great, thank you. Yeah, I might use that last piece as a segue because I really agree with that philosophy mm -hmm. as well. It's extremely important. I mean, you have to recognize that all of us up here also white and English speaking and we have a number of other other privileges that enable us to get away with a few things in our workplace or in the context of teaching that some people might not be able to and also that British Columbia is a huge province and so the context here in the lower mainland is going to be quite different than if you're teaching in Vanderhoof which is the geographical center of the province or way up in the north where the community might be smaller you have less anonymity in terms of your neighborhood and your ability to kind of um, share what you want to and then back away when it's uncomfortable um, might not be an option necessarily. And that's why protections in the Human Rights Code are so important and that's why protections that you have in your collective agreement as a teacher is so important to provide you backup um, if you run into problems like our colleague here earlier was describing, um, but also you know less serious issues in terms of you know yes absolutely you should have the right to be you have the right to be out at work, and your school district as the employer has to back you up on that. Mm -hmm. Can it be uncomfortable to insist that your rights are backed up? For sure, mm -hmm. that could happen too. It's not without tension, and uh, and um, and there are all sorts of spaces where the context of teaching where it collides with your personal life, not just sexual orientation and gender identity, where there's tensions there sometimes. That's always a, a shifting, changing thing um, in the dynamic of a public education system. But BC is in a pretty good space right now. Um, in my personal circumstance, I was, I've been out since high school and did quite a bit of activist work as an undergrad, including lots of public things. And so by the time I got to my teacher education program, sort of going back in the closet wasn't an option because the internet age was already there and and stuff that I had done protests that I'd been involved with or op-eds in the Ottawa Sun and um, um, being lambast lambasted by right-wing media pundits and everything like that was already was already sort of out there and so um, I did encounter some sort of eyebrow raising situations during my practicum where uh, one of my faculty advisors counseled me to not be out in the course of my practicum and I had a really negative experience with the principal at the school where I was doing my final practicum and actually was um, um, directed um, to cancel um, a visit from a youth group that was supposed to be coming in that very morning um, like an out in school sort of thing you talking about their experiences being out at school and um, so I was determined once I actually was employed in the school system that that circumstance could never like what do I need to know so so I can um, put that uh, for that situation not to unfold that way again and I also strongly believe in the role model piece it's way more energy um, you have to put way more energy into hiding mm -hmm. than to be out I think in the long term and I think that I have the moral responsibility for the students in my classroom uh, regardless of how they self-identify or who their families are um, to be out and you use the privileges that I have to to both do that and then be allies um, be an ally where I can for other um, marginalized groups. Could I just um, acknowledge um, in front of all of us 
how grateful we are for the way that you spoke uh, on Global TV when the uh, policy change was announced. Mm. You had a choice whether to put your personal self into that message, and the fact that you did, uh, we really commend you for doing that. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you. you. Well, thanks for it, Olshan. I mean, it was a toss-up. I mean, I did make a point of of saying in that that uh, my experience as a high school student or as an individual can't stand in for mm -hmm. a, you know, a youth today, a youth of color, my partner is from Hong Kong, and uh, his experience in school, and you know, it's, it's uh, but things, things have changed, but it's not perfect everywhere, and so I can't possibly comprehend um, what everyone is uh, experiencing. And that's a really good point, that uh, many of you, when you do go out into the world of teaching, uh, your, your environment uh, may be very different. You may not be a VSB teacher. Uh, you may be somewhere in a rural community. You are still, of course, backed up by the BC Human Rights Code and by the BCTF, but it doesn't mean that you won't have obstacles mm -hmm. and, and challenges. Uh, if you are in a jurisdiction outside of BC, you will need to know what your protections are, what your legal rights are, and that sort of thing, because in other parts of the world, uh, things are very different. We don't have global protection yet. So, John, how about you? Advantages, disadvantages? Well, I would say, again, mostly advantages, and but I'm talking to somebody who was mostly you know, not out. The only time I was ever um, out, and it, it wasn't by my choice, was when I was teaching here at UBC. And because I'd been in elementary schools all my life, I never thought of one night when a group of us went to celebrities after dinner, <laughs> and half of one of my uh, social studies, I was teaching social studies curriculum instruction, one, about half of one of my classes went, was in there. And, and I walked in there, and, and it just like, oh my god, I never thought about this. <laughs> and, and, um, but you know what? It was awesome. And I, re I remember uh, how wonderful it was and how welcoming everybody was to me. And, and the next week when I saw them in class, it was just wonderful, um, the, the increased warmth and openness and reception. So it was a really, really great ex experience. Um, the one thing, and I think Glenn's touched on this, I think we always have to think about, it's easy to say in some districts, for example, if you teach in Vancouver, you're going to be very privileged because it's such a progressive district, and you you would be protected, and you can you, you have a lot of leeway in what you do. But having been a faculty faculty associate and been in a lot of different districts around the Lower Mainland, um, there are some districts that are still very very um, controlling about it, and they don't want people doing things that that they don't agree with, whether it's on a religious grounds or whatever. And even when I was a faculty associate, and I was out in one of the um, districts in the Bible Belt, um, one of my teachers wanted to uh, do a unit that she'd seen a teacher do on a practicum in Vancouver on, on families to grade two classes at the time and talked about families were very different and this teacher even put up a picture of him and his partner. And so another teacher thought, oh, what a great idea. I'd love to do this unit. And so when she got into her next practicum, she did it, or she hoped to do it. And she talked to her teacher about it, and she was all excited. And the teacher said, no, <clears throat> we don't do that in this school. We don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that things have changed a lot there. So you have to, you know, you, know, you have to kind of assess and, um, I mean, be an advocate. And again, you're protected by wonderful policy and human rights legislation. So we, we have a lot more options and a lot more support. But you do have to be mindful of where you are and what the uh, tone is there. Mm -hmm. Can I just add something? Mm -hmm. um, just about communities and stuff. I did my I did my education and my uh, practicum in Quebec, and I um, was assigned to do my practicum in a very small uh, religious community. Uh, just outside of the university town where I was, and um, and I was assigned to teach uh, in Quebec. They have pre like junior kindergarten and K, and it was a mixed class. And um, I was going to do my final kind of big practicum teaching thing was going to be my unit on families. And so at the time, even though I didn't identify as queer, I thought, okay, great, and I'm going to talk about all these different types of families. There's one. Everyone there was white, everyone was there was Christian, and there was one family, um, the only kind of diversity in the class was one of the families had adopted, um, they had four kids, and their kids were from China. 
And so I thought, great, I'm going to talk about adoptive families. Of course, I'm going to talk about same-sex families. And my practicum advisor, who is super progressive, who is the one who did multicultural education and all that, my university was on board. And my practicum teacher was so reluctant. And she wanted to do it, but she was so nervous about the parents' reactions and how the community was going to do it. Uh, deal with it and I just thought like let's do it let's just see what happens and she was so so nervous but she decided to take a chance so we got this the kind of culmination of it all is we got this uh, photography exhi photo exhibit um, and you can do it as a practicum student too it travels all around the world it's black and white photos of all these different types of families from around the world it's beautiful mm -hmm. so we had them come in it's called like love makes a family I think um, the kids had done all these projects, had done poems about some people have two moms, some people have two dads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we did this kind of big exhibit, and these black and white photos were there, and the families came in. And you could see that, you know, their reactions, like it wasn't super obvious, but you could see that it was uncomfortable for them. Um, and some of them had conversations with the kindergarten teacher, who was my practicum teacher, and they all went okay, you know. So there was definitely a level of uncomfortability there, but... Um, everyone dealt with it and everyone was fine and life went on right and nothing terrible happened and so it was really great because the year after she wrote me a letter and she said you know that was really pivotal in my teaching career and now I have the confidence to talk about same-sex families and um, the stuff when I teach my kindergarten curriculum because I know the world is not going to collapse and if people have some issues we can talk through them yeah. and so I think that's a positive thing that can happen too is you know sometimes things feel like they're a little bit unsafe or that um or that you're treading kind of really lightly um but that's not always a terrible feeling right and so there's this um it might be uh, it might be uh, maybe in critical pedagogy but there's this you know line that i, I forget <laughs> so long ago but somebody talks about how if people aren't feeling uncomfortable in their learning, then they're not actually learning, right? And so that's kind of how I see all of this social justice work is that, um, you know, within reason and that you're not going to lose your career, but that if there are some families that are having some issues and if there are people that are uncomfortable with what you're doing, that's actually a, a great thing, right? Because that means that things are progressing, right? And that needs to happen in order for things to change, so. That's a great point. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Yes. Are you taking questions yet? Or did you... uh, sure. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I, I just I notice that all. Of, I mean, you all are speaking from a position of having jobs, mm -hmm. uh, and our teacher candidates don't. Mm -hmm. um, so that power differential of depending on you know you didn't feel comfortable because of that power differential right. in your practicum. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because some of our candidates do um, come out on practicum. Uh, they just start off that way um, and they're comfortable their school advisor supports them the faculty advisor of course supports them it's all good um, and others s decide to wait until they have a, a contract mm -hmm. can you speak t to that to, to teacher candidates who will find themselves in that disempowered position maybe glenn i'll let you sh coming from the bctf sure okay. well i think i think what you've summarized is the reality right i mean there is a power dynamic here. Um, many people are in a, well everyone, all of you are in a precarious situation and that you haven't completed your practicums and you are depending on people signing off on some things, right? So it is, we have to acknowledge it's a different scene than when you're actually hired to a school district and there's an employee-employer relationship and in that circumstance you're 100 percent absolutely protected, um, not just by the collective agreement, but the, by the Human Rights Code. And that doesn't just pertain to um, you being out, if, if you happen to identify as um, LGBTQ, um, but also in the teaching of the curriculum, because there are things now in the curriculum that reference gender identity, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, the topics um, at the primary grades around family diversity, and making sure that you're covering the full gamut of that. Um, depending on the community, there can still be, unfortunately, some friction around that. But there are systems in place, a variety of systems, to protect people who are in the contract. Um, for people in their practicum, I mean, I'd like to be able to say to you, you know, come out, come out, do what you like, but it has to be what you're comfortable with uh, within the context. We don't want anyone to sort of be, um, have their entire career ambushed um, by a situation um, like has been described here, um, or you know, say I was at McGill, uh, the situation I described, and I got really belligerent that day. Then the issue could have been around me being belligerent, mm -hmm. and, and things could have been easily shuffled off. Right? I rethink that situation all the time, 
in terms of how could I play that different, differently? And that, uh, you know, was there a system through the university, uh, through the faculty, faculty to go and unpack that? Well, after the fact, probably, but it was in the last week of the practicum, and, um, and uh, the moment came and went, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, there's no easy solution to that. Um, other than to say you should be able to, Oops, but what the protections are for you aren't as black and white, unfortunately. And I just want to add one thing too mm -hmm. about the, um, the curriculum. Uh, we still don't have uh, LGBTQ issues in the curriculum, in the social studies curriculum, or in, in any curriculum in, in BC now. And so, I mean, that doesn't mean we can't talk about those issues, but um, we can't really teach uh, about it in terms of it, it's not part of a curriculum where there's PLOs and hopefully that'll be the next thing we'll move into is actually as I, I hope some of you have heard that California actually is um, going to be bringing in uh, K-12 um, GLBTQ history curriculum and it'll be one of the first places to do it and um, I'm part of, I'm involved in the ARC um, Foundation with S Steve and a few others and one of our big pushes is to get um, GLBTQ curriculum um, in in BC, and hopefully it'll come across the country because that will make a difference too. And <clears throat> thanks for bringing that up, John. That's one of the things that I'm working on this year is is looking at curriculum and the new curriculum. There are places in the new curriculum where SOGI issues are uh, presented as sample topics. Uh, but there are very few, still very few places where um, uh, in physical health, uh, education in grades four, five, and six, uh, it, sexuality uh, and sexual identity are, are in the curriculum, but it doesn't, it's not specific that a teacher should, how the teacher teaches that. The teacher still has the autonomy to teach that in, in their own way, uh, which may not be very inclusive. Uh, of different sexual orientations and gender identities. Uh, but that's one of the things that we are working with the ministry and, and I'm doing a project this year where we're going to find lots and lots of um, yeah. opportune places in the new curriculum, the new BC curriculum, where this work fits in and provide lesson plans and resources that go with those opportune places. Yeah. And what I would add, probably the, more, the most important thing is to make sure that regardless of where someone's working in the province, that they have supports in their district to help them do that, regardless of what it says in the curriculum. So right now, again, primary, diverse family models. It's there, you're supposed to be doing that. So does my, is my school library equipped with books that feature a wide variety of families? Is there somebody that I could contact in my school district going, I'm thinking about doing this, but I'm, I'm worried about using the wrong words. Could you walk me through this so that the first time I do it, I can do it in a way that's respectful. Um, having those sorts of supports in place go a long way to sort of addressing, regardless of what the curriculum says. I mean, the sort of the, uh, the structure of the new curriculum is to have the content more general than what was there before, right? But that, you, that creates a problem when you're getting to some areas where historically have been neglected, whether that's been Aboriginal education or some of the historical apologies around the Chinese head tax, et cetera. Um, there need to be clear entry points so that we could say cohesively as a province that we're all doing this together. So the health and career stuff is one area where it has been upgraded somewhat to specifically say sexual orientation in the um, intermediate years, but there need to be a few other places where it's like, nope, I've got the permission to do this, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I know that in the, uh, the BCTF has passed a number of resolutions, uh, one of which uh, basically says that I believe um, school advisor teachers uh, need to be supportive uh, of practicum students who want to do this work. So you should be able to, uh, according to the BCTF, you should be able to count on your school advisor uh, to support you in doing this work. But as Dr. Carr alluded to, there is a power imbalance there and uh, the school advisor is probably not going to specifically say uh, you know, you're having a problem on your practicum because of your identity, they're going to find other ways mm -hmm. if, they, if they don't like, uh, if they're uh, homophobic or transphobic. Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, I want to have, I know that it's uh, quarter to one, and uh, I want to have a little bit of time for your questions for our panelists. So uh, please fire away. I think the first hand I saw was yours. Hi. Um, so uh, I'm one of the bees in and I was wondering, um, in terms of stuff that, like, the, the protection and the administration is great because I don't feel like I'll get fired or anything, but um, in terms of kind of, like, non-official classroom dynamics and school dynamics, is there a lot of help for navigating that? Like, my interactions with adult humans, there is a certain vision of young bisexual women, that, and I would definitely not want to be receiving that kind of attention yeah. from students, but... I think this might be a risk for a lot of young teachers in that, you know, we're closer to their age and they have questions, they might be kind of like, I don't know, transferring, but like, I just, I don't, it's a very sexualized identity and I definitely don't want that energy in the classroom. No. Do I just kind of have to like fire in all cylinders and be like, all right kids, this is what I like to do in my personal time, or do, how do we navigate that? <laughs> Well, I think, like, I started teaching when I was 22, and I think I was in an elementary school, so, and I actually intentionally did that, I think, because I felt too close to being, too close to high school-aged kids, um, but some of you will be teaching and be young in, in high schools, and I think there's a few things you can do in that, like, simple things, like even the way you dress, right? I mean, all these things are terrible that they need to be done, but you're right in that these identities are very sexualized, right, especially for women, and so in terms of looking professional, like really maintaining that, that, um, uh, so what I'm looking for, like that distance in the sense that you're a safe person, but you're also a teacher, right? Like you're not a, you're not a peer, you're not a classmate. So the way you dress, the way you talk, how you talk about things, like phrasing things in ways that are still quite professional. You know, like I teach um, sexual health education and I'm really, really careful, even with young kids about the words I use and the language I use because I think I think when you cross a certain line into things being too personal and not personal in the sense that I talk about my family but things too personal that make people feel uncomfortable like you can even sense that in kids right that you've done something that's a little bit off and so I think trying to maintain as much that professionalism piece is very very important um, and yeah just being really mindful of I think, yeah, like I said, the language you use. And um, I did, like, at the beginning, I would do a lot of rehearsing. Like, I would rehearse on my friends, or I'd look in the mirror, like, how am I going to, especially with sexual health stuff, like, how am I going to answer this question if they ask me this? Or if they're going to ask me, like, do you do this at home? Or blah, blah, blah. Like, what's my facial expression going to look like? What message am I conveying back to them when they're looking at me? What language I'm going to yeah. use, right? And then it gets easier and easier with time, and so now I can just spit things out no problem. But, you know... First off, it can be a little bit nerve-wracking for sure. So, yeah, I would just—I mean, that facial expression piece is probably very important. Like, practicing your poker face a lot of the mm -hmm. time, but also being clear that you know, yes, I'm bisexual, and right now I'm I'm in a relationship with a woman, or I'm in a relationship with a man. That's all fair game to say, right? But questions about what I do in the bedroom, students are not on. Like, sort of having you know, in a way, you may have to be sort of overcompensating or over-establishing mm -hmm. the boundaries in that regard. But that's—I mean—that's important for anyone. My sister. Um, is three and a half years younger than I am and when she started she's a principal now but when she started teaching she looked very young so just as a young female mm -hmm. teacher entering the profession I know that was yeah. something what you described sort of the pressure on her to sort of be kind of the hip cool teacher and how some of the uh, older male students at the school would want to try to interact with her I, I we had many discussions about her feeling the need to sort of over um, define yeah. the boundaries and that's what enabled her to get to get through when I was subbing so I would have just turned 22 I taught grade 9 P one one day at a high school and I just after that experience and it was grade 9 boys P and I remember just thinking I'm never doing this again yeah. for a very very long time like it just didn't feel good to me right but I do think like and the, the boundary piece again like I remember I had a kid in my class with two moms and he came up to me one day and he said oh my mom's like my mom said you're a lesbian, like, is that true? And I'm like, well, kind of, you know, I'm actually queer. And he's like, well, what does that mean? And I'm like, it means, like, I'm attracted to men and women. But I hadn't played it out in my head, so I kind of started rambling, and he stopped me, right? And he's like, whoa, whoa, that's too much information. Like, <laughs> and walked away, right? Grade five kid, and he's right, right? It's like, it doesn't actually need to be a ramble, just like I wouldn't go on and on, you know, if my partner was male. Like, there's just some things you just need to 
right? And so I think the practicing piece is really important because they don't, nobody, it doesn't feel good, right? To be a kid or to be a teenager and and feel like your teacher is trying to be the cool teacher and you're learning too much from them. It just, it feels weird, right? And you don't have to, you know, you can you can share some, but not everything mm -hmm. and, and still feel as if you're authentic and true to yourself. So you can say, well, yes, I'm part of the uh, LGBTQ community, yeah. um, but you know, that's my personal life and uh, we're here to actually do this. Uh, so, you know, it's important that I share with you that I'm part of this community and that uh, I've often told students that, you know, the reason we're talking about this is because um, sexual minority youth and, and people often face discrimination and, and there's name calling and, and I want you to know that I'm a safe person to talk to and I want you to know if this happens at our school that you can come to me. And so you, you're providing a rationale for why you're telling them uh, why you're sharing this piece of yourself. So mm -hmm. it also kind of helps to protect you uh, because there's an educational rationale to why you're talking about your yourself. Yes? How do you become a safe person? How do you, like, what's mm -hmm. the process? It's only something that, that it's born from, like, out of your own experience and you decide to be that safe person or is there a process that you have to follow? That's a great question, and it varies from school district to school district. Uh, in Vancouver, um, all of our schools are asked to have a safe contact person, and that person is a volunteer, and uh, it can be a teacher, it can be um, QP staff, it can be anyone in the school who, who feels comfortable uh, answering people's questions and, and being a, a channel for resources and communication from the uh, diversity consultants at the school board. So it varies school district to school district though, so it depends where you're working. Uh, but certainly if you have a passion, if you have knowledge and you want to do that, please I, I encourage you to step up and, and take that on. It's great. And it doesn't mean, like just be well, it doesn't need to be a formal thing. Like if your district doesn't have a system set up, being a safe person can mean that you have a rainbow sticker on your door, right? Exactly. Being a safe person means you have posters up about gender identity and whatnot, right? Being a safe person means you're conveying to your kids that um, that your classroom is a safe classroom for LGBTQ kids, right? And I think they sense that really early on if you're kind of really open to that. Absolutely. Everybody, everybody can be an advocate and a kind of a, a SOGI champion in their schools, regardless of official titles or, or whatever, just by making your space. Uh, and we'll have more workshops on that sort of thing throughout the year. I saw your hand next. Do you have yeah. some question? Um, so, Miriam, you talked about pretty much pushing your community, giving, giving it a nudge to kind of become more accepted. But what would happen if actually that situation would have turned wrong? Mm -hmm. Is that grounds for a dismissal? That you just pushed the envelope too hard and <clears throat> it just went really wrong? No, absolutely not. That doesn't mean that mm -hmm things might not be rough for a little while. I mean, there could have been a few parents that complained, right? Mm -hmm. And But at the end of the day, um, uh, Miriam was teaching the actual curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we're in a province that has a human rights code that recognizes a number of uh, groups, including uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. And so um, the jurisprudence on this, including many cases in British Columbia, have clearly established that the onus on the school system is to be inclusive. So even if there's a different set of beliefs at home, families are welcome to practice those beliefs at home. You as a teacher are welcome to practice those beliefs at home, but where that intersects with the public school system, that has to be parked. Um, and so um, at that point, um, you know, it would be good to contact your union and certainly apprise your, your school-based uh, uh, principal, vice principal, but they need to have your back on that. Okay. Yeah, so carry on doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. and, and just my dad that um, independent schools are also governed by the, uh, by the new policy, okay. so, SOGI policy, yeah. yeah. Okay, good job. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to return back to the, the first question that was asked about the in the corner. I think it's, I think one thing that wasn't mentioned and something that I think is really important is that we should 
like crystallize sexual identity down to the sexual acts that mm -hmm. we have to find it, right? Mm -hmm. and sexual identity is something that's a lot broader and involves a lot more um, to it than, than just the act of, of kind of homosexual kind of lovemaking, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where a lot of, if you look at the actual kind of um, the problems and the issues that come from, from trying to teach these topics or, or enter into that, is it gets kind of boiled down to the act of sex. And I think we, we transpire back to the kind of, you know, gay panic situations that would have happened a long time ago. And I think we're, I, I think it, it, it reduces some things to a very complex mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of um, concept down to something that, that's a bit too easy to find. So I think that's something really important when anyone's dealing with ideas of sexuality in the classroom, that it, it's it's not just kind of pushed over or can, you know, mm -hmm. refined to mm -hmm. to one thing, right? It, it's about a lot of other things. There's culture, there's a lot to everybody who, who is Homosexual. Thank you for yeah, yeah, sure. bringing yeah. that up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to go to this last slide in case anyone wants to jot these down. I will uh, try to put this on the uh, um, teacher education uh, the, the website. But there are some uh, articles that uh, that I found. Um, Huffington Post, Edutopia, the National Education Association is like the Canadian Teachers Federation, only in the United States. Uh, and Safe Schools Coalition is another organization in the States has an article called Coming Out. Uh, all of those are places you can get more information if you want to. Uh, do we have any last questions before we wrap up? Anybody burning to ask one more thing? Okay, I would like to uh, thank um, all of our panelists for coming today and sharing their uh, perspective and their stories. Uh, it, it, I know that UBC is not exactly central and, uh, and that it's sometimes difficult to make your way out here, so thank you for making the effort and uh, I hope that everyone's uh, enjoyed hearing, uh, hearing their stories.